Good evening. Welcome to the Mill Valley Historical Society's first virtual first Wednesday presentation of 2021. We have an amazing lineup this year, starting with tonight's show, Spirits of San Francisco Voyages Through the Unknown City, with author Gary Kamaya and author and artist Paul Madonna. My name is Deborah Schwartz, and I'm on the board of the directors for the Mill Valley Historical Society in charge of the first Wednesday speaker series and the oral history program. To those of you out there who are already members of the Historical Society, thank you. Thank you for your support. And if you're not a member yet, we hope you will be soon. Our membership is so affordable and just a click away on our Mill Valley Historical Society website. Your membership ensures that you will be alerted to future monthly speaker presentations. You'll receive Chuck Olenberg's charming Mill Valley history vignettes, and you'll be regularly updated on our historical events in our town and nearby. It has always been my hope that our first Wednesday speaker series program offered a familial community experience where neighbors and friends could gather together in a common area and learn from each other and support each other. And the Mill Valley Public Library has provided the physical space for that to happen for years. And now the library is providing a virtual space as well. So thanks to the Mill Valley Public Library for allowing us to continue our speaker series in a safe and accessible format. Tonight's talk will be an informal interview format that lasts about an hour. I'll be asking Gary and Paul questions about their book and their creative process. For practical purposes, the audience must be muted for this webinar. But with us tonight is Natalie Snoyman, the Mill Valley Public Library History Librarian. And Natalie is here to help. Wouldn't it be fun to interview Gary and Paul together? We can do that. Please submit your questions to Natalie so I can read them out loud to our guests after and maybe even during the discussion. Now, for those unfamiliar with Zoom meetings and webinars, here's a brief tutorial on how to manage this format. Functional tools are located at the bottom of your screen. If you can't see them now, just hover your cursor over the area and they should appear. Now look for the chat icon. The chat tool allows you to post comments, say hello to friends, and we encourage you to add substantive information during tonight's event. Raise hand and remove it. We won't really need this tool tonight, but why not? Let's give it a try. Raise your hand if you've read Paul and Gary's work and click the raise hand icon again to remove your hand. Finally, and this will be very helpful tonight, the Q&A option. You may have questions for Gary and Paul. This is where you can post those questions. And if you have comments to add, the chat function is the best place for that. Now here's a little background about our guests. Gary Kamaya is author of one of my favorite books about San Francisco, Cool Gray City of Love, 49 Views of San Francisco. He writes a popular history column for the San Francisco Chronicle. As co-founder of Salon.com and former executive director of San Francisco Magazine, Gary has been a fixture on the Bay Area literary scene for more than 30 years. And he's been pounding the pavement of his beloved city for over 50 years and over 25,000 miles. His keen eyes searching for clues of the past and his remarkable wit translating that into, the pro into prose which has made me laugh out loud too many times to count when I've read his books. His natural curiosity, his remarkable literary skills, and his endless enthusiasm have made him one of San Francisco's most popular writers. Award-winning artist and author Paul Madonna is author of All Over Coffee and Everything is Its Own Reward, and the creator of the Emmett Hopper Mystery Series. His unique brand of combining images and stories have been heralded as an all new art form and celebrated internationally. Gary calls Paul a poet with pen and ink. I'm so excited to have the opportunity to talk with Paul about his work and his artistic process and to share with you all some of the remarkable drawings he created for this wonderful book. How Paul and Gary met and how they became the creative team we have tonight is something we'll explore in tonight's discussion. 
Gary says in his book, cities are four dimensional universes and any given place within them is a portal that opens into an inconceivably rich Trevor treasure trove, one that exists in both the present and the past. So before we begin, let's close our eyes for a moment as we expand the internal lens in which we see our beloved San Francisco to see it as it really is in a fantastically vast estuary that holds one of the most beautiful cities in the world. I quote from the book, in San Francisco, a deserted street seems to open a window to the place's deepest heart. The sublime terrain tends to swallow up everything else, including people. The hills, the bay, the sky, the sea are constantly overpowering the human one here. Down any street, some unknown hill or patch or mysterious water appears in the distance and everything arranges itself around that mystery. Welcome Gary and Paul. It's a huge pleasure to have you here tonight. Obviously, I'm a huge fan. And um, let me just get my question for you. Let's start with you, Gary. Can you guys, are you there? Yes. yes. Are you here? <laughs> Hi, guys. Hi, Deborah. Hi, Paul. Hi, thank you. Thank um, you very much for coming tonight. And thank you all for being here. Um, Gary, I'm going to start with you, okay? Absolutely. Well, a cool great city of love and spirits of San Francisco both embody a multidimensional Zoom perspective as you pull in and out of time and space. Professors David Christian and Dr. Walter Alvarez call this big history. Will you please speak to this cosmic view as a storytelling tool? Hmm. Uh, sure. Uh, first, I, Deborah, thank you so much for having us. And thanks to everyone, uh, all, all the members and others who have showed up. Um, there's obviously nothing going on today in the world. So I know that you had a, a lot of free time to, <laughs> to come down and listen to a couple of guys talk about their book. Uh, anyone who did manage to pull themselves away from the armed uh, mob that stormed the Capitol, uh, we are deeply grateful. <laughs> and you, you must be a very uh, deeply uh, deep, deep fans and, or, or lovers of, of literature and art. So we really appreciate it. Uh, the the Zoom uh, thing, and thank you, Deborah, for that very generous and uh, perceptive introduction as well. Um, the Zoom question as a storytelling device, I mean, I really think of it more to me when I was researching Cool Gray City, uh, I sort of, it was almost like, what's the most psychedelic thing that I can find out about San Francisco? It's um, like, what... What aspect of its, whether it's its geology or its history, and these are the two mediums that have like the greatest scope of time in them, is the strangest and most alien. And I just wanted to find the most extreme point because that just excited me to do so. It just felt like if you can, it, it's there's almost something slightly religious or in any case, deeply sort of spiritual or ultimate about it. You're trying to find really odd, intense, deep things. And so when I was researching Cool Gray City, I ended up going down this rabbit hole for months of studying Spanish history, um, about 1% of which actually ended up going into the book because you know there's there's only so much room you have in a book that's dealing with 49 different sites of San Francisco to deal with the vast scope of the Spanish empire but what was fascinating to me about that story and how it coincided with San Francisco was San Francisco was like this decrepit bedraggled forlorn last stop the last end of this enormous empire. And so that became, yeah, it was a narrative device because it becomes something where you situate this city as this very pathetic kind of ridiculous place almost 
which is a wonderful way of just de you know, decentering it because you're going to spend your whole time talking about how central this is to you. And then to make it so meaningless and so paltry, I think I refer to it as like the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern of cities. It's just like this meaningless walk on that has no, no function at all in the great scheme of things. Um, but that that is it's actually a, it's a powerful sort of narrative device. But that wasn't really what I was thinking of. I was thinking of it just it's just I love uh, that that the craziness of that history and geology similarly. Um, you know, to trying to look just find out like what 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 are these rocks that are that are here and where do they where do they come from and how old are they and and all of that that sort of primordial history whether human or natural is just a fascinating thing. And it just provides a kind of a, a jarring and fascinating dissonant kind of theme that de that kind of, uh, it, it, it makes the city strange. And I think that's probably, I say in the introduction that both Paul and I, uh, in our own different ways, in our different mediums, we're aiming to create a city that we're all very familiar with, but to present it in ways where you see it completely afresh and you see it, frankly, strangely and sometimes in a disorienting way. And so those, that kind of uh, psychedelic, if you will, search for, for ultimate, uh, you know, dissonances and truths about the city is a real way of doing that. So that's, uh, that was a big motivation for that. You, uh, you you don't really think of yourself as a trained historian, do you? No, I'm not. A, I'm not a academic historian. Um, at this point, having you know written these portals of the past columns for the Chronicle for seven years, and the amount of historical research I've done about San Francisco of all types, both not just walking around but doing like voluminous reading, including many, many academic books, and I'm sort of academically trained as an English uh, student to have a master's in English. I, I consider myself an independent historian now. I, I actually feel like I can, oh, I can take that title of being a historian. I don't have a PhD, but I probably know more about San Francisco than a lot of people that have PhDs. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm aware of my lack of lettuce that way. Um, and, and it's, you know, there's, there's certain advantages to that training, absolutely, and things that I still don't know. But I also know a lot of things as well. And I've come at it from a, just a more independent door. So, uh, yeah, it, it took me a long time. I wouldn't call myself, I did not call myself a historian until the last few years. And I finally felt like, okay, I think I've done this enough that I can, I can, I can own that title. Um, you describe Paul as a poet with pen and ink. Paul, you're the next question, but I had to preface it with this. What do you mean by that, Gary? Oh, I mean, Paul's work is so, it's atmospheric, it's evocative, it's very precise, but it's not literal. And it takes you imagination into a lot of places. And uh, it just, for me, it just always felt deeply consonant and harmonious with the kind of writing about San Francisco or any or place in general that I do, because I aspire to creating that kind of sense of aura and depth and uh, an atmosphere and mystery that uh, Paul achieves beautifully in his drawings. So that's, that's what I meant by that. Paul, do you consider yourself a historian? Me, absolutely not. No, I, uh, I mean, maybe, uh, you know, when I was doing All Over Coffee, I, one of the things that I loved to draw were the wires. And, uh, you know, so the thing about San Francisco is between the clapboard and the wires, you've got all these wonderful lines. And for, you know, a, a pen and ink draftsman that they're, they're just ready made for, for uh, defining your perspective and, and breaking up the space. And, uh, you know, it was at a certain point that I, I went to a neighborhood and I realized, oh, all the, the telephone poles here have been put underground. And there are no wires crossing over. And, and uh, 
And I, it was, it's one of those moments that you realize something that you took for granted or that you always assumed was obvious that you, you didn't pay attention to until it was absent. It was sort of, I, I like to say it, it's like the, you know, you don't realize the street noise until, you know, suddenly all, all the buses are gone, all the cars are gone. It's like, I think we're all sort of experiencing a little bit of that right now. But, um, and, and then I realized that my drawings to an extent were inadvertently historical because I was, uh, you know, I, I draw from life. It was very much about looking at the world around me and responding and, uh, and capturing that uh, it, just through my own hand. And, and I think that, you know, Gary said that I'm, I'm precise. And even that word, I mean, I, I, I like that word and I agree, I am precise, I'm, and, uh, but I'm not literal, as he said, because my lines are wobbly, you know, my, my, my shapes are, are a little skew and that's because I think of drawing as sort of like handwriting and it has that same sort of, it allows one's character to flow through. And so that observation of the city and just saying that I'm drawing what is here right now. And uh, you know, it's interesting, I, I've gone, I take a lot of reference photos and sometimes, and that's for light and shadow, which we can talk about more later, but I've gone back at times uh, to a site that I've photographed and, and it, maybe it's taken me a year to get back to it. And it has looked completely different, um, be it that the building has been painted or there's been something else built or maybe a tree has been removed. And, uh, and so in those aspects, I think I'm almost this really sort of specific to the day type of archivist. Hmm. Paul, how did you two kids come together for this project? How, how did this happen? I mean, you're sort of here and he's sort of all over there. <laughs> Gary, you, I, you want me to tell the story? Sure. Sure, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is what, it's what, maybe five years ago, six years ago, uh, I get an email from Bloomsbury, a very cryptic email saying, you know, Paul, we love your work. Uh, there, there's an author that would like to work with you. Please sign this NDA and we'll send you over, you know, if you're interested. You know, so of course I'm like, all right, sure, you know, send it over to me. And uh, they send me uh, uh, the manuscript for Cool Gray City. And uh, I had been uh, aware of Gary, I think through Salon, I, I knew his name. And, um, and I started reading the book and I loved it. And, and I thought, you know, this is, this is perfect. This is very much the voice and, and the sort of feet on the ground type of perspective that could pair well with my images. And, um, and, also, and then I looked at the subtitle, which was 49 views of the city. I was like, okay, so I think this so I write back to them and I'm like, this is great, but I think maybe you want 49 drawings probably. And they're like, yeah, we see them as sort of, you know, you could do these half pages. I was like, all right, okay, 49 drawings. It's, you know, and I was doing all over coffee weekly at the time and I had started uh, my first novel. So I was, I was writing for, for the novel, drawing for that, writing and drawing for all over coffee every week. And I said, so how many, you know, how much time do I have to do these 49 drawings? And I think they said six weeks. And so it was just, it was an impossibility. I mean, to, in order to scout uh, alone, I, I wouldn't have been able to do it. Just the, the San Francisco weather wouldn't have permitted. So uh, unfortunately, I had to pass on that project. And but I, you know, I took the opportunity to reach out to Gary and say, "Hey, you know, one, great to meet you. Thank you for for being interested." Because um, Gary had requested that Bloomsbury reach out to me. And uh, it, was, it was his desire to have me work on the book. And I said, listen, I, I would have loved to work on this with you. I wish they would have called me a year ago. Um, and uh, so, we, you know, we, we both exchanged, you know, like, oh, too bad that, that this couldn't happen. And then I think it was about a year later because we actually met in person at a, uh, an award ceremony for the Northern California Book Award. Uh, Gary was receiving an award for Cool Gray City and I was receiving an award for Everything is Its Own Reward, which was my, my second Oliver Coffee book. And, uh, and, we, and we hit it off immediately. And like within minutes we were, we were laughing. It was like, it was almost, we had been like, we were old friends. And, uh, and that night we, we shook hands and we said, all right, instead of this sort of, oh, I'm gonna make a project and then come to you at the last minute thing, we're gonna design something together from scratch someday. We don't know what it is, but we just had a handshake and we said someday this is going to happen. And so fast forward to five years later, when um, I had an opportunity to retool a series for the Knob Hill Gazette, I thought of Gary and I called him up and I said, this might be our chance. Why don't we do this series together, but also do a book and just have this larger vision. And let's talk about what we want to make together and then build outward from there. 
And so it was a really wonderful way that we had this, this idea of collaboration planted in our brains. And I think also we had an experience with the book that we knew that traditional route of, okay, Gary's gonna do all his writing and then come to me to do drawings, or even if it was vice versa, if I had all these drawings and I went to Gary, that that wouldn't work, that we needed to do a, a serious back and forth and, and, and from piece to piece and, uh, and, and work on it as a true collaboration. Gary, um, you, you told me that working with a collaborator, collaboration is unusual for a writer and that writing is a lonely thing. Uh, would you please describe the difference in working together, how the experience changed for you? Good. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, normally writers, uh, especially when you're writing books, it's very isolating, very, uh, very solitary. It's just the nature of, of, the, of the endeavor. Um, you may have a research assistant or whatever, but I've never really even had that. When I write a book, I just am sitting in my room researching and writing. And that's, I, I'm, I'm, that, I'm fine with that. But there's something so wonderful about working with other people. I've had that experience more as a journalist I've worked on magazines for most of my career. I was an editor for, um, you know, 30 years. They're on various, mostly at Salon, but at other places. And I've worked with art artists and art directors as a journalist, and I've always loved that. Um, and I used to be in theater back way back in high school, which is the ultimate collaborative uh, endeavor. And I'm an amateur musician. That's also a, a collaborative thing. There's something that's that's just unbeatable about working with people that you respect, um, your peers, and they may be in a different medium, uh, but this is what the, the collaboration with Paul was so special because we're in completely different mediums, but we're starting the whole project, as Paul said, with the intention, this is gonna be totally collaborative and totally co-equal. No one is, this isn't being led, because typically, frankly, uh, when a writer does a book, the writer is like the big guy and he writes the book and then he gets an illustrator and the illustrator illustrates it. Not to, not putting down the illustrator, the many brilliant illustrators who do that, but it tends to be a little more driven by the writer. We weren't interested in doing that. We wanted to have this be completely equal for both of us. And we had such, you know, and, you know, I have tremendous respect for Paul. And, but beyond even that, I just wanted to do it that way because it's more fun. It's like you get more of an interchange, a meeting of the minds. And in the case of this book, Paul and I would go out driving around. We'd find places. We'd discard some. We'd take others. We'd go out, you know, we'd have drinks, we'd have coffee, we'd, you know, I'd show him things that he'd never seen, he'd show me things I'd never seen, and we'd kick them around, and, you know, and we had some really, you know, fascinating uh, both acceptances and rejections. Uh, one of the interesting things that happened in the course of that was I was really excited about this one amazing Victorian mansion called Nobby Clark's Folly, which is located in Eureka Valley in San Francisco on Caselli Street, uh, kind of right where Upper Market goes up and in that little intricate network of streets in that edge of Eureka Valley. And it's a really bizarre, fascinating house. It's like completely anomalous. There's no enormous, strange, over-the-top Victorian like that in that part of San Francisco. You'll find them in Pacific Heights or the Mission, but not way out in what, when that house was built, was completely the sticks. So I was really excited, and I said, Paul, let's, like, go out, you know, and he went out and scouted it, and he came back, and he said, oh, God, I'm sorry, Gary. Like, I've scouted it a number of different times. I've taken these reference photos, and the way that the light hits it, it's just like, there, there's, there's no depth, there's no shadows. It just, it, it falls on it in the wrong angle. And then I really realized, I'd known it abstractly, but I realized, oh, Paul is a plain air painter. Like, you know, he, yes, he could have made up the shadows or thrown them in, 
but he's actually, you know, he has really deep artistic integrity. And when he went out to see a site, and if it didn't have the depth uh, and the light and the, the nature of the shadows that he needed to make it his best work, he couldn't do it or didn't want to do it. And that, I really respected that. And it was, a, it was kind of an eye opener for me. And, but then what happened was uh, Paul, then we said, okay, let's go back to the drawing board. And there was a, the most famous Victorian in San Francisco. And I had almost not wanted to do it initially because it's so famous. It's the Haas Lilienthal house, which is the only Victorian in San Francisco that's actually only grand Victorian that's open for tours. And we decided to do it. Um, and I was, in the end, I was just thrilled because Paul did this amazing drawing of We're like- We're gonna show that drawing in a little while. People have never seen this building the way he drew it. So that was kind of a class, interesting example of the kind of serendipity and an initial disappointment. But, uh, you know, the outcome was actually far beyond anything that I could have dreamed of. So we had just so many great collaborative experiences. Mostly it's just fun. We really like each other. We really respect each other. We went, we just had a good time working together. And uh, uh, yeah, at the most primal level, it alleviates some of the creative loneliness of being a writer. You know, it's, it's great to uh, work with somebody else. So it was a lot, it was a lot of fun. Paul, did you ever find a place and say, that one, figure it out. There's some story somehow. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and But before I tell that, I, which will be about the Rock House, uh, I just want to add to what what we were talking about a minute ago to, uh, to what Gary was saying as well. Is in a way, that's part of the U.S. me if I was a historian and, uh, you know, I used the word archivist. And, uh, you know, that that's that desire to want to represent the light and shadow and, and you know, and what I love is about the time of day or if it's a cloudy day, it's the season that's represented. I think that lends itself really well to this type of narrative, to the historical narrative and then also the real personal voice that Gary adds to it. Because in a way, there's, there's that similarity. Um, you know, we're both staying true to real life and then infusing ourselves into it. And, and maybe, you know, one could say that in the, in the way that Gary writes his sentences, we can feel that same sort of, um, of intimate personality that I would then infuse into my line work. So, um, you know, there's probably these parallels really in our matching of styles of work as well. But um, yeah, so it's funny that the Nobby Clark's Folly, I really wanted to draw it. It's an amazing building. Absolutely, like architecturally, it would have been fun. And uh, yeah, I scouted it a couple of different times and then I, I have a compass. I mean, I, now it's on my phone because it's much more reliable, but I rely on my compass every time I go out to scout something because I've, in fact, I'm working on a piece right now, which you can see behind me for our, for our uh, February Spirits of the City for the Gazette. And when I was out there, um, it was a cloudy day, but it, since it was it's winter time, the sun is so far in the southern sky, I had to figure out, okay, am, am I going to get any sunlight in this season on this building and when can I come back? So um, yeah, just to sort of wander down that trail for a moment. So yeah, the Rock House, um, I used to have a studio on Potrero Hill, sort of on the edge of Potrero, close to the South of Market. You know what, wait, because we're gonna go to the Rock House. We're going to bring that picture up in that chapter. Okay. You want to wait to tell that story when we get to the Rock House? Oh, well, okay. I was answering the question about the piece, one that I've delivered to Gary. Yes. Uh, well, let's, let's, we, let's pick that up when we get to the chapter itself. Okay. That will be a wonderful way to, to understand how we actually got the, in, the, in the book itself. Sound good? Sure. Uh, anything weird happen while you guys were out scouting? Any uh, arrests for trespassing? I mean, did we break in anywhere? Um, strange San Francisco characters. Gary, <laughs> did, did we get in any trouble? <laughs> yeah, we, we got into a little bit of trouble. Um, we And we broke, we slightly broke into a couple places. Um, <laughs> nothing that, you know, I don't think we're gonna be hauled away by the gendarmes. It was pretty benign. And one of the virtues of getting older is that you tend to be arrested less or, or detained less because they're like 
this old dude, you know, what's he going to do? But the, uh, we, we, <clears throat> we, we have a, a lovely chapter. Paul did a fantastic drawing of Pier 24, 26 um, on, the, on the Embarcadero. And there are the, all of these old bulkhead piers um, on the Embarcadero that are fantastic and have amazing stories and they're visually stunning. And Paul, for the drawing, got right up under the Bay Bridge and drew it from below so you can see the Bay Bridge up above. Um, but before we sort of ended up with that particular perspective, we went out into that shed. And these sheds are kind of like, most of them are then this sort of locked that you're not really supposed to be there and you're not really supposed to be out and going out onto the piers. And we found an old, like one of those old chain doors that you pull the chain and the door rolls up. Um, and we managed to get it open a little bit and we crawled out. And then when, once we got out onto the pier, <laughs> we were like wandering around like, a, exclaiming about how great the view was. And all of a sudden Paul said, look out. And there were like, there was a manhole sized hole in the asphalt, like an inch behind me. And uh, we were, you know, I was about to fall into the bay uh, through that. <laughs> so the whole thing was completely falling apart. And then, uh, yeah, we saw some, another time we um, went down to Pier 70 um, down where there's this massive development project going on. And we went in, it's, you know, what used to be uh, this incredible, you know, the Union Iron Works and this incredible shipyard and all of this old Dickensian industry. And we sort of drove in through an open gate. And I don't think we were really supposed to be there either because a couple of guys in hard hats came zooming up in a in a little cart and like basically told us to get the hell out of there. So uh, we, you know, our scouting... Had, we had a few misadventures, but mostly it was it was pretty uh, it, it was pretty smooth sailing. Uh, but there were some there were some odd little moments along the way. Uh, go ask the next question. I just realized I stupidly didn't plug my computer in. It's going to die. So give me about ten seconds. I'm going to do that. Oh, good. Yes. Um, yeah, well, hey, I'd like to follow up if you don't mind about the the drawing of uh, Pier Twenty Four Twenty Six. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that um, the, you know that's another example of Gary and I being on site and talking about the, the different points of view that he might take in, in the stories that he would write, because you know the book is basically a series of vignettes about each site. So allowing Gary to take, you know, focus his lens without having to worry about transitions in terms of the narrative. Um, and so, you know, if we're standing there together, he can watch me sort of frame things and, and say, oh, well, you know, this composition is great. I'd really like to draw this. And he would say, okay, well, wow, okay, I can, because that works because I can tell these stories. And, or we would turn and he said, I have a great story about this. And we'd look and I'd say, well, okay, well, that's kind of, that's a really far off view. What if we turned the, the cameras, so to say, you know, this way. And so we're sort of composing our perspectives on the site, on site. And I would do a quick sketch. And so he would see visually which direction I was looking and how the image would, you know, uh, appear. And I would have a sense of what type of stories he wanted to tell. And, and, you know, we did that with a lot of the pieces and sometimes just even by email back and forth, I would say, oh, this is what I was thinking about doing. And he'd say, well, oh, well, you know, that's, that's interesting because I'm writing over here. And then we would, we would adjust to, to overlay with each other. Uh, Gary told me it's lovely how his text illustrates your drawings and your drawings illustrates his text. Uh, yeah. so that is a lovely collaboration. And your drawings are remarkable, so detailed, so alive the shadows, all this. So we've got some to show now. We'd like to, Natalie is going to bring some up just for people to see. Oh, I've, got a, I've got a great story about this one, Deborah. Okay, let's um, get it a little bigger. Can we get it larger, Natalie? Kind of hard to see, this is Lombard Street. I don't know if we can, okay, yeah. go at it, Gary. So when Paul called me up, and said, come over to my studio. Let's talk about collaborating together on this project, um, which was, you know, he was working on this series for the Knob Hill Gazette called Spirits of the City. Well, and I started to interrupt. We hadn't renamed it yet. Right. We hadn't, hadn't renamed it. 
Right, but it was at that time it was called Spirits of the City, was what the Nob Hill Gazette thing was called, right? No, it was called Quotable City. And oh, it was called Always oh, Quotable City. That's and right. I didn't even rap quotable. So we created Spirits. That's, as, that's as right. You and I. But I, we go in and, and we start talking about it. And Paul has this piece of art uh, up in his studio, on his old studio on Potrero Avenue. And it's an enormous piece. What is it, four by five or something? Like, I mean, this one I think is three by four, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's huge. I mean, it's just stunning. And I'm like, just I look at this, and it takes like a tenth of a second just to like understand. Oh my God, this is long. This is the most hackneyed, most over photographed, most received, most impossible to see place in San Francisco. And he's done this kind of ant on acid perspective of it that is just completely mind boggling. And when I saw that, I mean, I knew that like, you know, it was going to be great to work together. But when I saw this, it was just like the, you know, the maraschino cherry on the Sunday. Want, yeah, want. we can, we can totally <laughs> nail this because I'm going to find the historical literary equivalent of this crazy perspective and brilliant, you know, I, I not don't want to boast about my stuff, but he did a, a brilliant execution of this. And this is what I would like to do. And uh, so it, it was a great moment. And I still just love that piece. It's just like, you know, such a unique, a unique perspective and an incredible execution. I'm enjoying what? seeing how he sparks your enthusiasm for yeah, <laughs> for sure. Which is nice. Next photo, or next next drawing. Mm. That's yeah. Um, uh, Paul, let me just say a couple words, and then you talk about this one. Uh, we Paul and I decided this is the Joy Street steps. Um, and these are these remarkably grand steps that come off of the most unexpected intersection. They come off Pine Street just um, below Powell. So this is deep heart of downtown urban Knob Hill, in this, the fastest w Western arterial in the city. And nobody driving by this even notices these. And then they go up and they turn into this bizarre and surreal street that goes through what we call in the book, three universes and three blocks. And uh, when Paul and I talked about what should open the book, uh, we immediately both realized that this should be the first chapter. And, uh, and Paul, I know that you had an interesting way that you even discovered these steps. Yeah, you know, it, it, I was I was in a cab, uh, stuck in downtown traffic, uh, you know, going on Pine, and, and and the cab happened to be stopped right in front of the stairs. You know, this is mid block. This is something that if you're just flying along, uh, you're even if you look to your side, you're going to miss it. And I look up and I just see these this staircase, and you know, San Francisco has tons of staircases, and it's I, I feel like there's there's so many to discover. And yet, like Gary said, here it is in the heart of downtown. And I couldn't believe that I didn't know it. I, I felt like I'd walked that neighborhood, all of the streets when I was doing all over coffee, because I'd done so many drawings in that area. And, um, and so I just I immediately just pulled out my camera, but then the cab started moving. So I just noted the, the corner and then went back the next day and walked around and came across it. And I really felt like I had discovered something even after you know over two decades of living here. And um, Gary and I had already agreed to to work on spirits. And I, I don't know if we had named it yet, but you know, at that point we were really sitting down and talking about what is the form? How, how is this even going to look? And, and what is each of our contributions and how do we do that? And uh, Gary you know, had a, a long list of places and uh, mine was much shorter, but I, I called him up and I said, hey, do you know Joy Street? And immediately he's like, oh yeah, Joy Street, amazing. And he just starts telling me stories. <laughs> and, and, uh, and what I loved about that moment was that uh, I, even, even by discovering it myself, finding it, you know, uh, that uh, it, I don't know how long it would have taken me to even learn the stories that he told me in five minutes over the phone. And, uh, and I thought that that, 
was really beautiful because there was sort of this entrance way. And that's what I like about the, the perspective I took on the stairs, which is sort of, here it is, everyone. You know, we open up the book with this as well, don't we? Uh, yes, yeah. chapter yeah. one. Yeah, and so it's it's a lead in. And, um, you know, and I, I did with it what, you know, the things I love to do, which is the balance of light and shadow and, uh, you Obviously. know, the perspective. And, um, and, and just do some great compositional geometry with this too. And, and uh, you know, and I felt like it was this uh, very uh, synchronistic moment of we found an opening piece and we found an op for not just the series, but for the first piece to make together. Now I'm gonna ask Natalie to do something that's not going to be easy because time-wise we're going to need to move through. I'd love to go over some of the chapters with you just a couple to give people an idea of what this book holds. So Natalie, if you can just scroll through quickly and show us a few more of the images on our way to chapter seven, the rock house, which Paul had been starting to tell us the story about and I'd like to pick up where he dropped off. So are you there? Let's see, Natalie, there we go. There she As she's getting there, I'll start to tell the story, yeah. which is- uh, oh, can, can we go back and just quickly show some of the other drawings before the rock house? Because just to give an idea of what we're like, oh my gosh, look at this one. Uh, the Tian Hao Temple, the view to Koi Tower from Chinatown. I've never seen it from there before. Next one, we saw this back, keep going. Uh, and that's now on to the rock house. This is chapter seven. Now, what I really like about, again, I mentioned it before, is the interplay between an urban area and a natural environment. And this is a perfect example. Uh, First you, Paul, talking about this house, this painting, I mean, this drawing, and then Garrick, you can tell a little bit about the history. Mm -hmm. That'd be awesome. Yeah, um, and quickly, I want to say something about Lombard Street, too, which was uh, the idea of tackling a site that is, as Gary said, so hackneyed, so well-known, and tackling it in a new way. And I think that was, you know, for something like Lombard, that was a huge challenge. Yes. The Rock House, uh, you know, we didn't need to tackle it in a new way because it was a little bit more obscure. So I, I could do a more straight on portrait of this house or of this building. And um, so this was, this is one block off of Potrero Street. And you can actually kind of catch a small glimpse of the chimney when you're on the freeway. But uh, I, I, you know, I took a walk one afternoon from my studio just to get lunch and you know, varied one block away and came across this house and couldn't believe that I had never seen it before. And that's, you know, there's so much about this, like, eye opener of like, oh my God, how did I not know what was, you know, one block to my left for years? And, um, and I thought, okay, well, I really want to draw this because I love that interplay. I love that you see so much of the natural landscape. So I took a reference photo, called up Gary, and here's, here's the time when I did stump him. As opposed to Joy Street, when when he was just like, oh, I can tell you everything about it. Here, he said, I have no idea what this is. And so it was one of those moments that in the way that I had to report back to him that I'm sorry I couldn't do uh, Nobby Clark's folly uh, because of the light. He may have come back to me and say, hey, I know you wanted to draw this, but... You know, there, there's nothing great about, there's not really good stories I want to tell about this building. Fortunately, it could be, you know, because of Gary's tenacity in terms of investigation, is he did come up with, he, he called me up and said, I, there's some great stories. And so he, <laughs> uh, I was able to deliver something to him that he could then in turn learn about. And I feel like for readers, that's really interesting because now there's an input in terms of subject matter that came from two different points of view. Right, absolutely, and I love that because yeah, I would, I think maybe I'd seen this from the freeway but not known what it was, but I, I didn't really remember this at all. And Paul gave it to me and, you know, suggested it and it was kind of like being handed a wild card in a deck of cards. And it's like, well, uh, 
I mean, actually, the truth is, I think I would have wanted to write a chapter on this, even if this house had the most boring and inconsequential history, because we haven't talked specifically about how the natural world is manifested in this, but as everyone can see, this house sits on an absolutely mind-blowingly enormous slab of rock, in this case serpentinite, the California state rock, and this is without a doubt, um, I don't, I, unless there's some sleeper house that I don't know about, but I don't think so, this is the biggest slab of rock underneath any residence in San Francisco. And that's why they call it the rock house. And I, you know, I love uh, one of the, my favorite things about San Francisco is how it is riddled with rocks. You're just, you'll be walking down the street, uh, any street, it can be in a very upscale swanky neighborhood. It can be in, you know, in a very poor and sort of run down neighborhood. It can be in parks. It can be all over town. It can be in really strange spots, two blocks away from Californian Powell. There's a vacant lot with a chain link fence surrounding an enormous piece of gray wacky that just no one has ever developed. It's like a multi-million dollar lot, presumably because it's just too much trouble to blow up the rock. But this, uh, so I love, I love just that fact of San Francisco because it really mean the natural world is constantly crashing into your consciousness and sort of invading you in San Francisco, which is one of the most delightful things and unique things about the city. I don't know of any other city. There are cities like Rio de Janeiro and Hong Kong that have even more massive rock extrusions, but I don't think they necessarily have them in so many different neighborhoods all the time. So I might have wanted to do it anyway, but luckily when I started digging into this, it turned out to have a really remarkable history. Uh, it was, you know, it was built by this really fantastically lovely, unique San Francisco figure named Joseph Worcester, who was a extraordinary self-taught architect and this beloved religious figure who was a minister of the Swedenborgian church. And he had this built uh, as a orphanage and a, 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 to help young boys and men from troubled uh, backgrounds. It was called the Society for Helping Boys. And then weirdly, after that phase, it was actually a dormitory for, uh, for male students at, uh, at SF State in the in the, for a brief time before SF State ended up where it is out in out in the avenues now then it became the longtime home of a deeply eccentric professor of art named Rudolf Schaefer who had a whole uh, deeply idiosyncratic but quite brilliant and prescient a, a school of he called it chromato lyricism or something and he would he lived to be a, like a hundred years old and the way that he even found this house is kind of extraordinary. He'd had a, uh, his art school in North Beach. He was already like 75 years old. And his friends were telling him to retire. He was a terrible businessman. You know, his school was running out of money. He said, no, nah, I'm not ready to retire, but I got to find a new school. So he went to a psychic in Carmel. I don't know why he went down to Carmel. Maybe they have better psychics down there. But he, <laughs> he, he asked the psychic, said, hey, I need to find a building. And she went, I, I see uh, an abandoned building with broken windows on the edge of a freeway. And some, <laughs> this is how the story goes. Anyway, it actually sounds increasingly <laughs> implausible, but hey, it involves <laughs> a psychic. Um, so he found the building on the edge of, of 101 because on just on the other side of this building, and this is one of the things that makes it so surreal, uh, literally within 50 yards of this building is the 101 freeway right by uh, the Vermont Street exit to Potrero Hill. And one of the reasons nobody knows about this house is it's become a, it's on this weird little orphaned part of Potrero Hill that's been cut off by the 101 freeway. Um, it's near you know, San Bruno and Utah. I think it's at Utah and Mariposa Street. And uh, so nobody goes up there because if you go up there, 
all the streets dead end. They just run into the freeway or they run into other dead ends. So, and then there's this very strange building that has like the great room has a think a 25 foot elevation, which is staggering. That those three big windows you can see on the uh, on the north facing window there, the one that's more shadowy, that's like enormously high. So this Rudolf Schaefer guy takes it over. He builds a peace garden in the back of it. Finally, he dies. He has Rudolf Schaefer Day in San Francisco. And then the house enters into the even more surreal world of contemporary San Francisco real estate. And, uh, you know, it just gets sold for millions and then more millions and more millions still. And I think now it's worth like $7 million. And it's kind of stunning. And if anyone's driving on 101, as Paul mentioned, you can clearly see it as you uh, as you proceed going north. You look to the left and you'll see this kind of funny little part of the hill. So it was great. There was a, like, as Paul said, this is the kind of uh, example of the kind of collaboration we did that is really fun and unusual. And I, you know, I would never have thought of this myself. And and so having that kind of serendipity and that kind of chance element introduced into the creative and and research process is something that uh, is kind of a breath of fresh air. It keeps you from just recycling things you already know. And it, just may, it makes the book feel more adventurous and kind of more random. And that's a, uh, that was a really nice aspect, one of the many great aspects of the collaboration. On to the... I'd like to add to the, the, the same went for me in terms of drawing because you know it's it's so easy to go back to whether you know it or not to go back to what you know or be drawn to certain compositions or type of buildings or neighborhoods even and uh, forget to to get lost right and um, and and having somebody having Gary send me locations uh, I'm, I I drew some things for this book that I was like how did I never draw this before and that is a beautiful experience to have. Well, this book is just filled with jewels. For anybody reading it, you re it is the most interesting and bizarre collection of history, mysteries, stories, people. And in, in doing the research, I can only imagine how exciting it must have been to reveal all this information, just hiding in plain sight. The next drawing we have, is I believe my favorite. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And this is going back, we were talking about the Nobby Clark's Folly and how, you know, that one we uh, ended up not doing, but we settled on this very, very famous, probably the most famous Victorian mansion in San Francisco, the Haas Lilienthal House, which is now the, uh, has been the, the headquarters of, of San Francisco Heritage, which is an architectural preservation society. And, you know, again, like Lombard Street in a certain way, um, it's very easy for people that have been on the tour or driven by it or looked at it to just kind of go, oh, yeah, I've seen that one. But uh, this, this drawing is so magnificent. And as we said before, there's something about it that's uh, maybe the best word is uncanny. And it's not just gothic because you know, there's a whole sort of tradition of spooky Victorian houses, but this is not just that. It, it's, uh, it exists in some other, some other dimension of mystery that's, that's delightful. So I'm really, a, so it was just a, turned out to be a, a great, uh, a great outcome that, that Paul uh, and I ended up doing this one. And Paul, uh, why don't you talk about the process of, of drawing this one? Well, yeah, in the same way that uh, approaching Lombard, you know, with Lombard, I, I I was out there and, you know, what you don't see in that drawing are the thousands of people who are walking the streets and walking the sidewalk in front of me and, and stopping and taking photos. I mean, I was out there just doing my preliminary <coughs> drawing for, for maybe an hour and there was probably, you know, I don't, there were easily thousands of photographs taken and so by, by other people. And and my thought was, how do I render this in a way that that makes it new or or a unique perspective that isn't like the thousands of photographs that are taken every day there? And um, and so that's why I did that, as Gary calls it, the Anton Acid perspective. 
Um, and then and then there's something like going to the Haas Lilienthal, which is also, you know, maybe not as um, popular with the tourists, but I think equally as iconic in terms of San Francisco lore and, and for San Franciscans. And so, uh, but at the same time, I didn't want to do the Anton Acid for, for this house because it wouldn't do it justice. And so I come back to that word portraiture, which is then instead of trying to take a uh, 100% new take on it, try to really just present it straightforward. So there's nothing between the viewer and the image. So it really feels like, just like I was standing across the street doing my preliminary drawing, uh, that you were standing there right there with me looking through my eyes. And, you know, I think what I bring to it is a little sense of playfulness. And, and uh, you know, these wooden structures, while they're uh, well, you know, while they are straight and, and true, they've been through an earthquake or two and, uh, you know, they have a little movement to them. And, and so I think my lines lend itself well because while my perspectives are on, you know, you can look, the, the, the house, it, it feels like it's moving a little bit. It's, it's, it's settling a little bit on its own, even as you look at it. And that is the personality of the place that comes through. My little bit of sort of Edward Gorey that can come out and, and give it an enchantedness. Mm. What the pic, the image is very small for unfortunately, but when you're looking at it in the book, it's very hard to take your eyes off. Your eyes, you just start traveling around and looking at all yeah. these details, and you're right, it does feel alive. And what's also so very interesting in is discussing this house, you are discussing the subculture of San Francisco and the very powerful culture it is, the history of Jews in San Francisco and how different it was for them than the Jews that were in the East Coast and the small cadre of uh, people that knew each other in Bavaria yeah. that came to San Francisco and flourished. So much interesting history that I hadn't really realized all embodied in this image. One of the most wonderful chapters. Yeah, no, that the that, that story of the Bavarian Jews of San Francisco, and many of them were from this, just a few villages, often a few miles away. Um, you know, Levi Strauss was from a village that was only about 15 miles away from the little village of Reckendorf, where, you know, William Haas, the, uh, the builder of this house, and three or four other magnates uh, lived. And uh, so that's that's a wonderful story. And another aspect that Paul was just talking about that was an, a nice, you know, kind of harmony of, of, of text and image. He, this is, he was talking about the playfulness of this image. And um, one of the, I have a section, the way this book kind of works is each chapter, each image has anywhere from four, five to 10 sort of historical vignettes, and they're all relatively short. So there's a number of different sort of historical and personal perspectives. And uh, one of the vignettes uh, about this house is just about Victorian architecture. And one of the things that, you know, that's so lovely about Victorian architecture is that it is exuberantly, sometimes ridiculously playful. And it's just, you know, it, it actually inspired horror in, uh, in really great architects like Willis Polk and more austere modernist architects who viewed architecture more as a high art and, you know, sort of decried this mania for turning out endless wood lathed pieces and just this incredible profusion of colors. And absolutely, there's things about Victorian architecture that are absurd and rococo and ridiculous, but it's playfulness and it's sort of exuberance and it's youthfulness are enduring. And um, I think that Paul captured that quality really well in, uh, in, in, you know, there's almost, this almost looks, you can almost see a little kid taking a bunch of, of little to toy blocks and going, I think I'll put a pediment over here, which is kind <laughs> of what a lot of Victorian architects did. So it's, uh, it's really, it's, I love this, I love this drawing. And he described the Victorian houses that seem to smile. 
Yeah, yeah, that they smile and they smile well. A, a, a historian wrote, which is a, a great thing. They smile well. <laughs> also, the irony of most of the money that was really made from the gold rush was from mining the miners. Yeah, that yes, and actually many of the of the Jewish merchant princes that came to San Francisco were wise enough to realize that early on that you know if you had a good head for business there was a lot more money to be made as they said the expression was mining the miners <laughs> and uh so uh, William Haas was in dry goods and in groceries and that was far more lucrative there were a few 49ers that found big old nuggets and got rich but not so many but if you were mm -hmm. a, had a good head for business and you you know opened up at the right time a lot of huge fortunes were made in San Francisco and this there was a whole row of these kind of um, houses most of them don't exist anymore along uh, Van Ness and Franklin this happens to be on Franklin at Washington but within about four or five blocks there was just rows of houses many of them owned by this remarkable Jewish subculture within San Francisco. Our final drawing is chapter 14, The Sunken House. I love this. Again, we're back to the rocks in a sense, or the geology, mm -hmm. and the way that liquefaction during, uh, during the earthquake of 1906, and then trying to develop houses on marshlands, of which most is gone nowadays, but at one time was all around the bay. And this wonderful, can you talk? Well, first of all, I love the drawing. And there's your wires, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is one of Paul's, these, these are some of the more prominent wires in this book. I think I love them. They're coming right, coming right at you, which is, <laughs> they're fantastic. So this is the sunken houses. Tell us, Gary. Yeah, so um, South of Market, as many people know, is all, was once, part of Mission Bay. So it's all landfill, hundreds of acres of landfill and marshy land. And um, tragically, during the, the great 1906 earthquake, this was where the greatest loss of life was. And a uh, massive, uh, just houses sunk into the muck, like three and four or five story boarding houses, hideously all collapsed against each other and then just just burned, fell and burned with the loss of hundreds of lives. Um, everything was destroyed. So this house is not a pre-earthquake house. There are no pre-earthquake houses south of market. But what happened was they this ground all subsided because made land, as they called it, or you know, reclaimed land, landfill <coughs> tends to subside. If it has water under it, it, it sinks down. So all of these streets, this is on Shipley Street, which is around Folsom and Sixth. Um, all of these streets sank down as much as six or seven feet. Um, and then they just built houses on them. So these are just regular old houses. This is just a regular house standing on the street. But then in the 1930s, I believe it was, the city decided to regrade the streets up to standard grade. So they just put the grade right across this house. Uh, don't ask me why the people living in this house had to uh, endure suddenly going into a John Malkovich 13 and a half <laughs> floor universe. But if you look closely at this building, it's like half buried by the street. You can see these two little windows uh, down at the bottom, those, th that's supposed to be extending six feet further down. Those are like garage level, ground level things that are now covered. So what I love about this is it. there's very few places that reveal the earthquake. By its nature, the earthquake simply destroyed and fire. The fire was, of course, the far greater damage, the fire caused by the earthquake destroyed everything. So you don't see that many examples or that many sort of historical residues or leftovers of the earthquake. But these few streets, and it's not just Shipley, there's some on Natoma, Clementina, all these little south of market alleys. There are a few of these left, increasingly few. A lot of them have gotten torn down. Some of them got damaged in 1989 earthquake. 
but there are these sort of wonderful remnants of the catastrophe. And uh, Paul and I went out and I think Paul hadn't uh, been aware of this before. So it was really fun to uh, turn him on to this weird little scene. And I remember you were super excited when you saw it. Yeah, and actually the, the light from, the, this is the day that we were there. I mean, the, I, the photos I took for light reference and I think I might've even done a quick sketch while we were out there. Just yeah. I mean, really just stood across the street and, and uh, you know, did a quick, uh, and I was like, Gary, this would be the perspective. This is, right. this is what, I, and, he, and he was like, perfect, great. That's the perfect building. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it was one of those serendipitous moments where the, the hour could not have been better. Uh, you know, it e easily could have been three hours in either direction, then I would have had to come back. But, uh, I, you know, again, it's something that I would have wanted to draw on my own because of the curious character of the building. I mean, it, it looks like a stunted or, or building or a building. It's sort of been like half filled in. It's like up to its shoulders. And uh, I just, and, you know, never found cause to or gone by or found it on my own. So for Gary to, to point it out and to point my eye to it, I was just like, yes, absolutely. I couldn't wait to do it. <laughs> this, this book is just filled with odd and wonderful historical tidbits. And I have to bring this one up. Um, I was surprised. I mean, I'm a historian and I, I hadn't heard this before that San Francisco was almost named San Ignatius. Well, I mean, it, no, it, it, I, I think I don't actually say that in that chapter. I say that it could have been, could have because, been. because what is not that well known is that the uh, Franciscan order was only given charge of Spain's New World religious mission a few years before San, before the sacred expedition of 1769. Um, I believe that the, uh, the Jesuits, which is obviously the Saint Ignatius, the founder of the Jesuit order, the Jesuits had been the original uh, Spanish uh, spiritual force in the New World. And through a variety of strange historical circumstances, including one of my favorite riots of all time, the hat and cloak riots in Spain, which resulted from a, uh, a law limiting the size of cloaks and hats that could be worn by Castilian nobility and which were seen as an insult to Castilian pride. And this is all involved with all kinds of politics about one of the king's uh, advisors who was despised. And that it had these, these riots had these massive ramifications. The king actually had to flee. And it, they played a role in the Jesuits falling from favor and then being replaced with the Franciscans. So I sort of play around, this is in Joy Street. The reason this even comes up, it's a rather uh, a peculiar digression, but I'm, I'm fond of peculiar digressions. The reason this comes up is that on the Joy Street steps, oddly enough, just when Paul's drawing of it, just at the top of what you can see, there is a landing <clears throat> in which for some peculiar reason that I've never found out why, there is a little shrine to St. Francis, a lovely little shrine. And of course, St. Francis is the patron saint of the city of San Francisco. Um, so I just do a little riff on how, you know, it, it actually, because if it had not been for this change and the Jesuits uh, being ex kicked out of their role leading Spain's spiritual mission in the new world and the Franciscans coming in, the city could have been called St. Ignatius. <laughs> and, uh, you know, which would have been uh, more appropriate for Governor Jerry Brown, who's probably the most famous uh, Jesuit in, in San Francisco's modern history. And I sort of talk about how it, it would at first blush seem like, oh, the Jesuits would, that'd be a terrible name for San Francisco, because you think of the Jesuits, St. Ignatius was a very driven hard driving divine and his followers were called soldiers of God. And we all know that St. Francis was this mystic and he loved animals and flowers and he was a man of incredible peace. And he sort of, you think of him as like the flower, the ultimate flower child of San Francisco, but that's actually kind of a reductive 
way of looking at it because the Jesuits are actually deeply liberal and they're incredibly socially active. And, and so if, if it was named after St. Ignatius, the San Francisco, that would be pretty appropriate too. Anyway, that was a, 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 that peculiar Another little digression. Little that you throw in. <laughs> a couple last questions we've got time to think about. How has the book been received so far? Paul, you wanna take that? Well, I, I think the best way to say it is it's been on the bestseller list for 11 straight weeks now since it's been out. I think that that says a lot. It says a lot. Congratulations. Yeah, people, people seem to really like it. You know, it's, it's great. We're very both thrilled and overjoyed. You know, I've, the, the, this is my third book and you never know what's going to happen with a book. My first book sank like a stone. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, you put a book out into the world and you hope people like it and so far they're liking it. So we're very, uh, very gratified and pleased and uh, thrilled about that. Here's a, the question, how has making this book changed both of you or has it? Hmm. Um, I'll go first there. Um, <clears throat> well, I think it's just, um, boy, it's sure given me a deep appreciation of, of, how art can illuminate a space, a location, a place that you may have thought you really knew well and a really great piece of art by a really talented artist like Paul just you know, opens up new perspectives. So it's, uh, it's really given me a, a deeper appreciation of that. And then as kind of, this is a little bit what we talked about before, but it's, it's given me a real, uh, a real appreciation and uh, and deep, uh, deeply gratif gratified feeling of collaborating and of working with somebody that I really respect and that brings so much to the to the uh, process. So um, so yeah, I think it's it's kind of it's it's the changes are mostly involving the you know how I see the city and then the the sort of fun that's available and a different way of doing the creative process. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of small changes. I think creatively, uh, you know, each from project to project, uh, I'll speak personally, uh, you know, I want to challenge myself in different ways. And, and sometimes that challenge is, uh, is not as apparent to the viewer, but happens really on, on the like, internal side for myself. And this book was sort of the opposite of what I did with All Over Coffee, which was, um, you know, I, I was doing this really sort of meditative and, and the overlooked, I didn't want to draw anything that was iconic in All Over Coffee. It was sort of one of my rules was, if I see a bunch of people taking a photograph in one direction, I'm going to turn around and draw what's in the other direction. And, uh, you know, with this book, I, you know, I said, you know, it's, it's not about worrying about whether I'm gonna do the postcard drawing as if that is somehow demeaning of, of doing a drawing, but that it is actually a challenge to draw the things that, that, uh, that are iconic, like Lombard Street, like Hostel Lilienthal. And, and then also to, to put aside my, you know, whatever aims that sort of, again, the sort of poetic aims and say, no, I wanna do something that's sort of in service Right, like um, I'm going to step back, and I'm I'm going to do the do things that are interesting to to other people as well. Put them first before me, and and um, and it's not that that was a, a, a difficulty for me. It was more there was a shift. It was an intentional shift, and so you know the change that happens is the willingness to say, you know, I'm going to do a different process. I'm going to apply my my skills, my eye, my craft in a different way for a different outcome, and. You know, I'm going to work with somebody that I have a great deal of respect for, and I'm going to, you know, take take, uh, you know, he will lead, I will lead, we will go back and forth. Well, I really take my ego out of this, and and again, it wasn't a difficult. It was more of just great. This is what I get to do this time, and so the change that comes is what did I learn from that? And and uh, you know, it's when I think anytime you do something that is in service. You, uh, you get a lot of, of joy that comes from so just sort of the gratitude of those who receive it. It's beautiful. Uh, coming to the end here, I, I wanna ask, um, 
Gary, you, you, this has been a fantastic, actually, you, use of both of your time during COVID shelter in place. And certainly walking empty streets as people are sheltering has its own advantages and it, it does allow you to see the world differently. Can you speak, I mean, this is, this has been a big day politically. It's, it's been a difficult 10 months for the country and the world. And in your intro, Gary, you have a, a lovely way of talking about the convalescence that you were going through mm -hmm. as you were recovering from your surgery and watching the changes and hopefully the convalescence that the city goes through. I, I would love you to talk about that. And if you wouldn't mind, just read a section of that intro for our audience. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, most of this book obviously was not written under COVID. Uh, we did the bulk of it before, but we were fortunate. Um, our deadline was earlier, but they hadn't, it wasn't a hard deadline. And so we kind of reached out. I, I had the idea. I said, you know what? I can write a chapter about COVID. Um, it was May and the book was going to ship in August or something, but it wasn't closed yet. Um, and I reached out to the editor and said, can I write an intro about the city under COVID? And, and I, then I asked Paul and, you know, I asked Paul first, I said, would you be interested in drawing something? He said, sure. And the editor said, yes. So I wrote uh, the preface to the book about um, the experience of walking around San Francisco during the lockdown. And it had just so happened that I uh, had to have one of my already artificial knees. Uh, one of them gave out, unfortunately, after a mere 10 years. So I had to go back and have it replaced again. Um, and I was lucky because uh, I got in by about two weeks before they stopped all elective surgery because of COVID. Um, so I managed to get it done. And then I was convalescing when the lockdown order, uh, London Breed decreed the lockdown order for San Francisco on March 14th or something. And I had just gotten home from, you know, I'd actually been staying over at my mother's house recuperating because I couldn't go upstairs. And um, and I'd just been home for a few days. So it, the, the lockdown coincided with this recovery from this major surgery. So in this, this preface, I talk about how, you know, walking around an empty city was really exhilarating. And even though it was, you know, really sad and worrisome and, you know, was well aware that there was a lot of tragedy and suffering and death going on, there was also an element of kind of exhilaration about just having the city all to myself as I wandered around with my dog and sort of seeing it with fresh eyes. And then I talk about how it also in San Francisco, you're really fortunate because San Francisco is so physically beautiful and has such deep natural beauty that when there's no one around, that actually brings that out more. Whereas if you're in, say, New York and you're wandering down Fifth Avenue and there's nobody on the streets, yeah, that would be surreal and exciting in a way, but it would be more depressing and fundamentally wrong. Um, that's a much more human place. And San Francisco is a big part of its charm for me is kind of its inhumanity, not in a cruel way, just in the fact that the universe is always battering in. So I talk about that in the, in the preface, but then I sort of modulate and say, hey, look, you know what? I don't really want this city to be an inhuman, empty, like stage set. And uh, so I'll just read what follows from that. At that moment, I realized maybe I'd been alone too long. Being a writer makes it easier to be under quarantine. Hell, we're always locked down. All we do is sit at home working all day anyway. But it also exacerbates some introverted tendencies I have, not all of them particularly healthy, and under their malign influence, I really realized I had begun to emulate the narrator of a certain Simon and Garfunkel song. It was all well and good 
to use the opportunity of the streets being deserted to commune with the rocks on Telegraph Hill Boulevard. But I didn't want to turn myself into a rock. Luckily, it wasn't hard to break out of my metamorphic malaise. Just walking around and looking at all the empty and boarded up storefronts did the trick. Yes, I love San Francisco's natural beauty, but I love Cafe Trieste just as much. And the crowd of tourists at the Powell Street cable car turnaround and the Chinatown branch of the library and SF Jazz and friends I can actually visit in their homes and the motley line of Latinos and Google employees at El Faro and the Congueros at Hippie Hill and Golden Gate Park and Union Square on a sundress day and city lights at 11 p.m. and Market Street with its holy eternal grifters and the tabletop jukeboxes at Gaspari's and Jazz Night at Specs and the six egg shrimp dish at Yee's and the Castro Theater and opening night at the opera and the upstairs booths at Vesuvio and miraculous aquatic park and all the other unnecessary and divine things that humans have created here. Take those things away and San Francisco really would be just an exquisite lifeless stage set. Stars don't really trump streets. You need them both. I badly want that living city back, but not until it's safe. Making it safe, of course, is what we've all been doing for the last seven weeks. That's the reason the streets are empty. And lately, as I take my walks through those not quite so deserted streets, it has occurred to me that my city and I share something. We're both convalescing. We're both doing physical therapy. We're both on an upward path. And so as I walk through San Francisco these days or sit in my apartment, I see a different kind of beauty than I did at first. Not just the desolate beauty of the city's empty streets or the ageless natural beauty that is her birthright, but an invisible one. The beauty of her people locked down inside their doors, staying the course, saving their city, in his meditation on convalescing, Nietzsche wrote of a reawakened faith in a tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, of a sudden sense and anticipation of a future, of impending adventures, of seas that are open again, of goals that are permitted again, believed again. As we stand shoulder to shoulder in our separate homes, our goal is coming in sight, rebuilding our city. And that goal and that unity of purpose is more beautiful than any view in San Francisco. If you like tonight's talk and are interested in purchasing, we urge you to shop at your local bookstore. We have a list of local bookstores in Mill Valley and around. And anybody that's attended this event, I imagine, has a local bookstore that they love very much. Um, I, I have to say before we go to a quick Q&A, thank you so much, both of you, Paul and Gary. It's a real honor for me to have this time with you. I'm so enjoying the book. It's funny to think that a, a book on history becomes more than that, it's a book on history and art. And I can't tell you how many times I burst out in a quick laugh because of some witticism or some observation that just brightens the whole experience as does the inspiration and beauty of the art. I, I'm just so glad that you could join us this evening. Um, I Thank would you, love to, to, there's just a couple of questions, uh, but unfortunately, I am having trouble. Can can either of you see the Q and A? I see something that says, "Oh, oh, here's one from a gentleman uh, that says, what are your thoughts about the Cliff House changes?'" Um, could could you guys hear that? Yeah, you could hear me. 
Yes. Um, uh, well, all I know about the Cliff House is that it's closed, right? Um, which I very, very sad, um, kind of devastated. You know, I, I don't know whether there's talk about new owners taking it over. I just happened to read today that uh, I guess the, the National Park Service, I think, has been in partnership with the old owners, the Huntalus family, I believe. And because they weren't able to reach uh, agreement, it means that it's kind of like the Awani Hotel in, the, in Yosemite, um, that they can't use the Cliff House as the name of the restaurant anymore. Um, and that they just removed that sign. And that just seems very sad because the Cliff House is, uh, you know, we're talking, we're going back to the days of Mark Twain. You know, Mark Twain took a famous frozen ride out to the Cliff House. Uh, it's a deep part of San Francisco. So, um, you know, so many wonderful places have been lost and so many more may be lost in the future. And uh, it's a deeply sad, troubling, concerning thing. And that all of us who love San Francisco um, are going to have to try to uh, do everything we can to save uh, the ones that are still can be saved and maybe try to bring some back some of the ones that have closed. Um, but it's, it's very sad. Well, I think, I think that's it. Uh, this, I have just a couple more things to say before we sign off. I want, I'm excited to say that Betty Girk's new book, Adventures of Two Miwok Children, is now available. Natalie has a photo of that. Uh, it is available through the Mill Valley Historical Society website. As many of you know, the author, Betty Girk, is a, the author of Chief Marin and a Mill Valley Historical Society board member. This new book, recently published by the Historical Society, includes illustrations by Edward Willey. It's extremely beautiful, historically accurate, and utterly charming. A lovely book for the young and old. And next month, we hope to see you on February 3rd. Um, we have a talk titled High Times with Big Brother and the Holding Company and Janice Joplin. And our special guest speaker is Big Brother drummer David Guest. I interviewed David. We have his oral history and the oral history collection with the library. Wonderful man, wonderful story. And um, that's it. So thank you all for joining us this evening. We wish you good health, well-being, and get this book. Thank you so much, Deborah. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Have a good Happy night. New Year. And thanks, Natalie.